Before this video begins, I'd like to ask all of my subscribers to go to the first link in the description bar and subscribe to the Mayor of MGTOWN's new channel. His channel was unfortunately taken down by YouTube. He had over 7,000 subscribers. He's a pillar of the MGTOWN community and he's doing some really, really excellent work that benefits homeless men and men online. So please, before you even watch this video, please click on that link or search YouTube for the mayor of MGTOWN and please subscribe to his new channel. Thank you very, very much. Hello gentlemen, this is CS MGTOWN. The motivation to script this video came after reading what now feels like an endless number of online articles over the past 24 months that lament the falling behind of boys and men. The article that finally got me to put pen to paper, so to speak, was a rather absurd article published on the Huffington Post site titled Sex Segregation in Schools is Bad Policy. And of course, all of the references will be in the description bar. The author of the article, a Mr. Lucas Waldron, argued that sex segregation in schools is a quote-unquote bad policy because it would alienate trans students. That's right, his entire argument boiled down to the supposed emotional needs of trans students who, based on reliable estimates, currently make up 0.3% of the population. He ignored the mountain evidence that the current incarnation of childhood education disproportionately harms boys mentally, emotionally, and adversely affects their ability to earn an income in an area of work they may find pleasing. So I personally have long suspected that mixed gender schools correlate with worse outcomes and cause perhaps irreversible damage to boys and the men they become. So the goal of this video is therefore to provide an overview of the current state of education in terms of the impact on the male half of the population, then offer workable evidence-based solutions. Before kind of going into things, I want to give you an idea of the current state of affairs. The notion that primary school teaching is a suitable and appropriate job for women only has a very, very long history. Ever since the introduction of elementary state education in the UK in 1870, teaching younger school pupils was then and uh, you know now uh, regarded as female work. Currently in the UK, women still dominate the teaching profession. Out of the 365,000 plus teachers in the UK, 74 percent are female and it's worth noting that male students slightly outnumber females in the uk the result of this over reliance on female teachers and governmental policies aimed at creating an environment where girls can succeed has been an undeniable feminization of education melanie phillips is a british journalist and author like hundreds of other academics and authors She's lamented the very, very real feminization of education. In a 2002 article for the Daily Mail, she stated that the reason uh, for the poor performance of boys versus their female counterparts in the British GCSEs is nothing other than the wholesale feminization of the education system. In GCSEs, A-levels, and increasingly degree courses, coursework accounts for an ever greater proportion of the final marks. This in itself favors girls because boys tend to like and do well at sudden death exams. They like taking risks, putting their wits against the odds. Girls don't. So girls usually prefer to work steadily and conscientiously without gambling against memory on the clock. Boys tend to be calmer under pressure, which is why at the degree levels until now, boys achieved more first class grades than girls who tend to get safe two ones and two twos. I hope that translates for my American listeners. A two one is a second class upper and a two two is a uh, second class lower. Furthermore, the curriculum has expanded in ways that suit girls rather than boys with the proliferation of soft subjects like general studies, sociology, or drama. The evidence also suggests that boys and girls learn in different ways. Rece research has shown that boys are more ego-driven, gaining more satisfaction from competing with each other. This may explain why boys tend to do better at exams than girls. So I would personally go on the record to say there probably isn't a large gap in the difference between what boys and girls can learn, but there certainly is a big difference in the best ways to teach them and the best environments. Nevertheless, education policy dismisses such differences and imposes instead an agenda of equality. For the last 30 years, teachers and school administrators have made a determined attempt to change a school system they believe to be hostile to girls. The assumption was that since boys tended 
to opt for science, maths and technology, and girls for humanities and the social sciences. This proved discrimination against girls. And I guess it never really occurred to them that this pattern had evolved because each sex naturally gravitated towards the subjects they had most aptitude for and hence find more appealing. The dogma is that boys and girls were identical and these differences therefore had to be corrected. The result was active discrimination against boys. As James Tooley comments in his book, The Miseducation of Women, and this is a quote, girls began to be privileged over boys at schools. Teachers gave priority to girls in the classroom, discussions, playground space, and sporting fixtures. The masculine content and orientation of textbooks, topics, and tests were removed in the favor of female references. Teachers were forbidden to use quote-unquote sexist language, and male teachers bonding with boys through jokes or shared allusions to sport had to be reprogrammed out of the system. During the 1980s, moreover, one project followed another to get girls into studying math, science, and technology. But it wasn't sexism that was keeping girls away from these subjects. It was their choice and lack of aptitude for the more intellectually demanding subjects. So time and time again, it has been shown that wherever they have an opportunity, boys gravitate naturally to STEM on average, and girls to social sciences. There's nothing wrong with this. Clearly, if any prejudice existed, it may have been right to address it, but this wasn't prejudice. It was rather that boys and girls behaved in different ways. This was never an issue in single-sex schools, but once co-educational schools became the norm, the differences became striking, and people assumed that the differences were due to discrimination. Now, there have been some pretty severe outcomes and the big question I found myself asking was what happens to boys when they are educated in feminized classroom by predominantly female teachers? The impact of this can be felt on many fronts for the majority of boys unlucky enough to be caught in this net. So the first area I'm going to look at is how boys have fared academically. The effects on the academic ability of boys has been pretty disastrous. It's prevented a lot of boys from reaching their true potential see very very early on boys begin to struggle under the current model by the age of five according to statistics boys lag behind girls of the same age in reading writing and maths official statistics suggest that just 59 percent of boys met the expected standard in writing in 2014 compared with three four three quarters of girls in reading, 68% of boys met the standard, compared with 80% of girls. And in maths, only 22% of girls struggled to count to 20, compared to 29% of boys. The current schooling model has also been quite deleterious to male mental health. In an article in the March 2015 edition of Esquire magazine titled, The Drugging of the American Boy, read, by the time they reach high school, nearly 20% of all American boys will be diagnosed with ADHD. Millions of these boys will be prescribed a powerful stimulant to quote-unquote normalize them. A great many of these boys will suffer serious side effects from these drugs. The shocking truth is that many of these diagnoses are wrong, and most of these boys are being drugged for no good reason, simply for being boys. So this one-fifth or 20% is pretty consistent in most industrialized countries which share a similar feminized education system to that of the, of the USA, including the United Kingdom. And I guess what I find most disappointing is that, of course, ADHD is a serious and real disorder, and a misdiagnosis can result in a needless regimen of powerful you know, medicinals administered to a developing brain. So you may be asking, okay, look, what's the link between psychotropic med you know, med medication and public schooling? Well, according to the author of that paper in the Huffington Post, whose opinion is supported by numerous pediatric and psychiatric clinicians, it's about, quote-unquote, and this is a direct quote, forced obedience. Forced obedience by female teachers who perceive the natural inquisitiveness and the boisterousness of young males to be a pathology. It's about female teachers being unable to cope with male students, and these female teachers wanting the males to be like the female half of the class, resorting to drugs due to their inability and these are my words here, to earn the respect and admiration required to lead boys. So you see, boys are on average more energetic and enthusiastic while girls prefer to sit quietly and play nice. The female environment being too placid for most boys results in fidgeting, and that is deemed to be misbehavior that must be straightened out. An interesting quote in a WebMD article on the teacher's role 
in diagnosing ADHD explains the process rather well. And again, this is another quote from the WebMD article. Teachers are often the first ones to recognize or suspect ADHD in children. That's because ADHD symptoms typically affects school performance or disrupts the rest of the class. Also, teachers are with, with the children for most of the day and for months out of the year. Since teachers work with many different children, they also come to know how students typically behave in a classroom situation that requires concentration and self-control. So when they notice something outside of the norm, they may speak with a school psychologist or parents about their concerns. So as you can see, it's about a, a student being quote unquote disruptive. It's about how model students behave, i.e. girls, and the medication of male behavior that deviates from this supposed norm. This may go some way to explain why, according to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, put out some data that boys have an ADHD diagnosis rate of 13%. So 13% of all boys will be diagnosed with ADHD and girls about 5.6%. So it's nearly double. I think this nicely goes into the sex differences in learning. So you, you see, there's a growing recognition that in addition to anatomical and physiological differences, there are psychological differences between the genders that affect the way young males and females of our species think, communicate, and behave. The, these differences manifest themselves at the playground, at school, and at home. See, by the age of four, boys tend to become more defiant, more vocal, and a little rebellious. We push the boundaries, even when we know there are consequences. According to Sarah Jane McCormick, a, a psychologist, all of this behavior is completely normal for boys and generally settles down as we mature. Mrs. McCormick, in her paper, went on to say, boys can become very boisterous and have boundless energy at this stage, becoming particularly interested in very rough and tumble play. All of a sudden, they start acting physically, wanting to run everywhere and climb everything. And they can also become very, very strong during this time. This natural inquisitiveness and rambunctiousness is, is part of the male nature and strongly impacts how boys and girls prefer to learn. You see, as a result of these sex differences, boys tend not to cope very well with long periods sitting at a desk, simply doing, listening, speaking, reading, reciting. This doesn't work for us. Rather, we tend to learn best by moving, making, touching. That's how boys tend to learn. Now, one of the hypotheses that I had before I made this video was that most of the poor outcomes we see among boys right now, you know, for, for, within the schooling system, could be linked to the attitude of female teachers towards their male uh, pupils. When I then scripted the video and, you know, carried out all of the research I needed to, 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 to make it into a, a worthwhile video, I realized that, of course, it's multifaceted. You know, the, the reason for why boys tend to have negative outcomes, it, you know, it's certainly more than the attitudes and the sex differences. That you know, there are lots and lots of small things that kind of go towards this. But, but for sure, one of the interesting parts is the attitude of female teachers towards their male pupils. There's a new study on gender disparities in elementary school performance. The first study of its kind to examine both objective and subjective performance. And the study found that boys were given lower grades than girls, even in cases such as maths and science, where the test scores were equal to or higher than the girls' test scores. So it, it seems like out-and-out -out discrimination, except that there's a pretty interesting point. Teachers didn't downgrade boys who had identical test scores to girls if they sh seemed to share the girls' positive attitude towards learning. In fact, the opposite seemed to occur. The, well, the quote-unquote well-socialized boys received a small grade bonus for their quote-unquote good behavior relative to other boys. So what this means, at least to myself, is that boys who ape the mannerisms of girls and behave obsequiously are rewarded. This is not necessarily consciously uh, discriminatory on the part of the female teachers. It's well known in study after study that women show and in-group gender favoritism. One of the questions I've always asked myself is, do women make good teachers? And again, my own personal